Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa afdur salati wa atamu tislimi ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Amma ba'd Respected brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh So Muhammad Habib asked me to talk about evolution I just wanted to come and just do a talk about various things So Um and you always have to be careful when you're speaking about a subject that's not really your area of expertise and I'm not, you know, I, I don't have a background in science and so on. So you have to kind of read up and be careful and make sure that you're representing the ideas accurately, which is always difficult because quite often that doesn't happen. So, um, I will ultimately resort back to resort to deliver this talk in a way that ultimately relies more on my knowledge of Islam than it does on my knowledge of, of evolution. Okay, inshallah. And I'll, I'll explain. I, you, you'll see how I do that. So, so firstly, um, why? I mean, why has Muhammad Habib asked me to talk about this? Or why is it even relevant? Um, and the answer comes from, you know, from, from multiple perspectives and there's lots of layers to it. Firstly, because we live at a time when the theory of evolution uh, is extremely popular. Uh, most people you encounter will tell, depending on who you speak to, basically. If you speak to somebody who is a bit of a kind of uh, 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 a secular atheist kind of ideologue um, for whom evolution is the nail in the coffin of religion, right? Then absolute evolution, evolution, evolution is the greatest idea ever. I think, in fact, in fact, one of the four uh, new atheist kind of horsemen, Bennett. I think it, De is it Bennett or Dennett. Bennett. He said that actually. Uh, evolution is the greatest idea in human history. Something along those lines. Um, it is absolutely fact. You know, Dawkins. Richard Dawkins said that it is. We, it is as factual as you know our, our understanding of uh, planetary systems you know and so on right so stuff like that so uh, it, that's it depending on who you ask right it is an extremely important idea theory scientific fact and so on um, you ask a religious person who isn't particularly interested in science, kind of gets on with their deen, gets on with their salah, it's like evolution, what, who cares, doesn't matter, right? But ultimately, and I'm going to talk really, I'm going to categorize the audience of this conversation a little bit actually as I, as I move on. But ultimately, evolution is important because it's to do with science and science is important today. We live in an age of constant scientific discovery, right? Science has made contributions to human life that are inescapable, that affect all of us. Uh, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively, but the discoveries themselves, objectively speaking, can we can still say that the, the knowledge, the increase in knowledge is a good thing, even though perhaps sometimes people have used it in, in ways that have resulted in death and destruction. Uh, on the one hand, a complete corruption of human nature on the other hand, um, you know, the, so, some of the advancements in some areas that have resulted in technological advancements in the me in media and in media consumption and so on have, on the one hand, been extremely informative for us. On the on the other hand, been um, extremely damaging for us on the biological front um, uh, and in the natural sciences. You've got all of these advancements in uh, in medicine. Right, that has in, that, that has uh, enhanced doctors, the, the medical community's ability to to heal people, to treat people, um, and, you know, and so on. So it's it's very it, it absolutely dominates right our life in in so many ways. Okay, 
Um, nobody wants to go back to if, to like to how things were before, right? Um, everybody takes advantage of 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 science in some way or other. <clears throat> but more importantly, science is an important part of our children's intellectual development. This is the most important point. It is a fundamental part of our children's intellectual development. There are three science subjects that all of our children study at GCSE. All right. So there are conversations about science that inevitably will capture their imagination. And therefore, the question of what is the relationship of science with Islam, with religion and with Islam, is a, is, is a foundational question. It's an extremely important question. All right? So we need to start with that. And I'll throw, I'll, I'll start by, really in order to talk about the relationship between two things, right? It's important that we have a good understanding of those two things. What are those two things? What is Islam? What is science? I mean, we can proceed from there, right? So if we were to ask, what is science? And I'm not going to go into any kind of long conversations, right? If you look up the word science, what is science? On Google, right? You get three dictionary definitions. Okay? And the question I'm, I want to ask you is, what is Islam's relationship with each one of those? So one of them is knowledge of any kind. One of the meanings of science is knowledge of any kind. Any problems with with that meaning and Islam? No problems. Right. Another meaning of science, uh, you know, slightly more kind of developed definition, is a systematically organized body of knowledge on a particular subject. A systematically organized body of knowledge on a particular subject. Anyone have a problem with that definition? Do you, do you think Islam would have a problem with that? Right? Uh, to be honest, that, that, that's a leading question, right? You know, in terms of relationship, if we would say, what is Islam's relationship with that, with, that, with that definition? Then the answer would be, Islam has a very good relationship with that definition, in the sense that it is exactly according to that definition that we call our sciences Islamic sciences. Right? So when we organize Islamic knowledge, all of the knowledge that we have received from our ancestors, right, from our Salaf, from our predecessors, we organize them systematically into subject areas and we call them sciences. Right? And we call them sciences because we understand generally our kind of loose relationship with the word science is according to this definition that science is a systematically organized body of knowledge on a particular subject. So, therefore, hadith is a science, and therefore, we use even in, in mainstream academia, like universities, if you, if, you, uh, if you did a degree in Islamic studies, you'd come across terms like hadith sciences, right? Quranic sciences, you know, and so on, right? The Islamic sciences. So no problem there. The third definition you'll find is the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. All right? So basically it is the study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. Now that is a much more qualified definition of science. Right? So when we talk about Islam's relationship with science in the context of a conversation about evolution, which definition are we talking about? The third one, right? It is much more defined, it is narrowed down. What this definition tells you, right, and this is actually really, really important, and I know I'm taking it out of a Google definition, but this is true. And uh, are there any doctors in the room? Maybe in Q&A you can, you, can, you can confirm or deny this, right? Oh, so they've got one there, right? Mm -hmm. It is really, really important to understand, first and foremost, science within its own parameters, right? What is science ultimately interested in? And sometimes these lines are blurred. Science as knowledge, 
If you think of science as knowledge, then of course, you know, knowledge is interested in truth, so therefore science wants to answer all of every question. Sometimes you'll get some some atheists who'll be like who'll come who 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 conflate and they'll say, we don't need religion because science can answer all questions. Which part of science can answer all questions? Biology is certainly not going to answer all of the questions about reality because it has a very specific parameter outside of which there are an infinite number of things, right? Chemistry is not going to answer all of your questions because it has a very specific parameter. Chemistry is interested in certain things outside of which you have an infinite number of things. So it can't, you, you know, it, it, it can't answer all questions, right? But then you say, oh, but no, we're talking about science, not chemistry or physics or biology or particular, but science itself. But over here too, do you mean science as in knowledge of any kind? Or the systematic study of any subject of all scientists, is that what you mean? Then yes, we agree, right? Science can answer all questions, but that's not really what you mean though, is it? So it's a conflation. What you mean is the natural sciences, right? Because the natural sciences has certain discoveries that are presumed to clash with religion, with certain religious truths, and often certain Christian religious, religious truths. Right? You know, it has a particular relationship. Science has a certain historical relationship with Christianity. With Islam, it's slightly different, although we have our own issues as well. So there's a whole question of history. So the point over here is, if we take that definition, you realize that generally when you think about science and scientific developments, etc., etc., then it's really to do with the physical and natural world. Not just that, but also it is limited to a certain methodology. It's not just about studying those two things, but it's specifically studying those two things through observation and experiment, which is a methodology, which means, for example, that philosophy isn't science, although you can't really do science without philosophy. It's kind of weird, but you get my point. My point is that philosophy or philosoph some of the many topics that are studied in philosophy that are more to do with rationality and logic and so on, and, and exploring, exploring aspects of reality theoretically, right? That isn't the same as the scientific method, which focuses on observation and experiment. So, if your if the subject if your subject focuses on learning the reality of things based on observation and experiment, and something is beyond observation and experiment. <laughs> then does your subject cover it? Does your subject cover it? No, it doesn't. So there are things that basically science can't cover or isn't intended to cover. I mean, scientists can dabble in whatever they want, of course, but it, it, it's not in, your methodology doesn't, it doesn't cover it. Or at least to study that aspect of reality using this methodology would be fundamentally flawed. Right, because the methodology isn't suited to the to the knowledge that you're interested in. So that's extremely important to think about, right? So when we think about Islam and science, or religion and science, it's important to ask ourselves, well, what are we talking about? What are we talking about? And then if we're going to ask, does it clash? Does it agree? Then fundamentally, there is no clash. At the basic principle of science is interested in this particular thing in this particular way to study this particular area and using this particular methodology there really is no problem does that make sense and ultimately if you want to do a like for like comparison then you have to look at in the islamic tradition how do we study things right in the islamic tradition how do we study things and do the methodologies we use to study certain aspects of reality clash with the scientific method. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So usually religions are interested in truth. Religions are interested in reality. If science is also interested in truth and reality within the same in that in that same broad sense then we can have a like for like comparison. We're gonna have a conversation. If science isn't interested in truth, isn't interested in reality under that broad spectrum, then it's not a like for like comparison. People are conflating, confusing 
right? It's, and, and sometimes that conflation is deliberate. You say to a young person, look, science can answer everything, so we don't need reality. Poor young guy is confused. Actually, well, when it comes to the question of religion, we're talking about one thing, or one a set of truths, fundamental truths, and when we're talking about science, we're talking about something completely different. So right from the outset, there should never have been any clash. Who's guilty of the conflation? The guy who's trying to confuse your son or your daughter in school. Could be a teacher. Often is. All right, so these, there are some, sometimes there's lots of different ways to come at this. There's lots of different ways to have these conversations, okay? But it's important to recognize that there's lots of confusion and, 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 and in that confusion, there's also lots of overreaction. Sometimes us religious people, we overreact. We overreact to things without realizing that actually this is not a big deal, okay? Inshallah, so that's just a little something for everybody to think about, okay? Why do people say science and religion are not compatible? People say it, that's why you've invited me to talk about this, because it's causing confusion. The confusion stems not really from evolution itself, but from the idea that science and religion are not compatible, right? So sometimes it's because some religious people behave irrationally and without knowledge. Would you agree that some religious people do that? Yes. yes. A lot of religious people do that. We behave irrationally, right? and without knowledge. In fact, we don't even stick to the rational principles, right, and the dictates of our own knowledge tradition. Do you understand? And that causes all sorts of problems. And you know who, who it causes the biggest problems for? For our kids. Because let's face it, right, we grew up with a set of assumptions, we've inherited it from our parents and we've accepted it. Our children have exposure to a particular educational and intellectual environment, right, from a much younger age perhaps than we did, okay? And they're much more, so like my children, right? I mean, I, I went to school in this country, so I suppose I can't, but there is still a difference. I was much more accepting of my parents' authority and their cultural background and heritage out of loyalty, out of blind loyalty. And also because the way they lived, I could see a very, very clear difference between the way they lived their lives and between what I was exposed to in school and what we saw on TV and etc. etc. Right? So so there was a natural resistance built into me. I went into my generation. Okay, I'm in my forties by the way. Okay? So we're talking about my went to school in the 80s. And that's the case with generally with people in my generation, right? People in my generation got into crime, right? Committed certain sins, etc., etc. But there aren't too many people in my generation who have left the deen because they were confused about because they were confused by evolution. Do you understand? And there are reasons for that. And that a lot of that is simply to do with just you know, questions of identity, uh, our attitude towards our, our cultural heritage, you know, and so on and so forth. Now I've, now, I've raised my children, right? My eldest is 18, going to university next year, okay? And naturally my relationship with them is very, very different. First and foremost, there's no language barrier, right? My children's mother tongue is English. They don't, I'm Bengali, they don't speak any Bengali. Hardly. They understand their grandparents, that's about it. They speak back to their grandparents in English. Right? So, already those kind of, those barriers that showed me that there is a very big difference between me and them, between me and other people, they're, they're already, even through my own, because of my own assimilation, right, they're starting to erode. Right? They feel much more comfortable as, as English speaking Muslims. I was going to say brown people, but not everybody's brown. Not all Muslims are brown. <laughs> all right? So, so you, you understand my point? All right? So, they're much more comfortable. Right? So, naturally, they're more likely to assimilate things from school, more readily from school and from Western culture. Right? From TV, from media, from books, from all of that 
all of that information that they now have access to that by the way I didn't have access to so that's a big difference just I wasn't bombarded with as much information when I was growing up so they they're, they've, they're, they're able to feel much more accepting they're much more accepting of all of that stuff and therefore the only so they don't have a cultural hindrance they don't have a cultural barrier the only thing that gets in the way for them the only thing that can truly get in the way from that can truly be an obstacle is an alternative narrative right meaning an alternative set of truths an alternative set of beliefs meaning it has to be knowledge knowledge is really the only way the only the only thing that can protect them from the dangerous aspects of what they're taking in school it's not culture they know their parents are different but they're not they're no longer thinking my parents are different from them they're thinking my parents are different from me <laughs> You, do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? And we need to wake up to this, right? We need to wake up to this because our, you know, our children, like I so said, we're raising them, etc., etc. And we're like, oh, you're Muslim, you're this, that, and the other. And they're thinking, well, you're kind of different. You know what I'm saying? Because it's, it's just generational. Things have changed. Which, which means that if we haven't, if we have now, when we say things that are that don't make sense. There's loads of stuff that my parents' generation said that logically makes zero sense. They make no sense. Not based on any kind of universal logic. And they make no sense exactly. There's all this cultural baggage. Makes no sense. Makes no sense logically, makes no sense systemically. Right? And I had to go to that I had to go to an Islamic institution to learn that a lot of it was nonsense. Do you understand? Which actually gave me a great deal of protection because I realized actually it's not just from a kind of Western scientific perspective that I'm looking at this and thinking, hang, this doesn't sound right. But actually Islam agrees as well. Do you see what I mean? And, and also you get to realize that actually Islam is very logical. Okay? So, 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 one of, so the reason that, come back to the original question, and I, I will, I do waffle by the way, and I'm really tired, so I'll waffle more. So I have to be a bit more disciplined, which I, I prepared a few slides just for the sake of disciplining myself. So let's get back to the original question. Why do people say science and religion are not compatible? Well, because some religious people behave irrationally without knowledge. Religious people behave irrationally and without knowledge. And by religious people, I'm talking about us. Because who else comes to the masjid? Don't think it's somebody else, us. Because religious people come to the masjid, all right? So, and the second reason why people say science and religion are not compatible is because some people think science has the answers to everything, so we no longer need religion and scripture. And here, we have to differentiate between science as a methodology, right? For learning things, for studying things, and science as an ideology. Science as an ideology. Many, not all, many atheists, they adopt science as an ideology. So, but, so ideology is a word that a lot of people may struggle with, right? But what, are, what an ideology is like a religion. Do you understand? It's a set of ideas that you commit to even if they may not be rationally sound. Does that make sense? You commit to them, so there is a there is a loyalty, a political allegiance type of relationship. Does that make sense? Right? And often and people's relation let's face it, people's relationship with religion is sometimes like that. It's often like that. Right? Most ordinary people, their relationship to religion is more based on more based on loyalty and identity. It's it's to do with me because it's my religion and that's really where a lot of their commitment comes from. Spirituality, etc., comes after. In Islam, your spirituality comes because you practice the religion. Allah gives it to you. Does that make sense? But it doesn't mean that the basis of your religiosity or your religiousness is knowledge. It often isn't. It's often just your own identity. I am a Muslim, so therefore I better pray. Okay? It becomes intellectual when you study the proofs of your religion. It's only when you study the proofs of religion that it becomes intellectual. But as long as you as long as you're just adopting what your parents told you or adopting what your teachers tell you or adopting what the Moran Sahib tells you, right? Then it's more to do with loyalty and following others. Which is exactly the case with many, many people and their relationship with science and their relationship with 
evolution. It's really important to understand this. Just because somebody is spouting, all of you young people, just remember this, right? Just because somebody is coming and talking to you about science and talking to you about evolution, doesn't mean they know what they're talking about. And doesn't mean it's based on knowledge, right? And if, the, if, they're, if they're like, if it's like an atheist type person, then nine out of 10 is based on ideology. That means they don't believe in this stuff because they're truly convinced. They believe in this stuff because they must. Because it's the only way they can justify their atheism. Do you understand? I think Dawkins said this, right? I just heard it from a, from, from a video. I think Dawkins said something along the lines of Darwin turned us into non-believers in God, basically atheists who are able to who are able to validate their atheism on intellectual grounds. That's what Darwin gave us. That's what evolution gave us. Before there was a kind of you know, he was they did the, the, the grounds for substantiating disbelieving disbelieving God weren't very firm and they felt like evolution and the theory of evolution and Darwinism kind of put them on a firm intellectual footing. Does that make sense? What does that tell you? Forget about whether that's true or not. Because you might be thinking, is that really true? That's not the point though. What this tells you is that Darwinism becomes necessary for the committed atheist. He needs it or she needs it in order to feel validated in his or her disbelief in God. Otherwise, how do you deny all of the signs of creation around you? How do you deny all of the signs of Allah around you? Do you understand? When they're screaming at you, if there isn't an alternative explanation for them, Darwinism provided that alternative explanation. Does that make sense? What that basically means, therefore, is if that's your relationship with atheism, if, sorry, if, if that's your relationship with Darwinism, not you guys, hopefully none of you, but if that's anybody's relationship with atheism and evolution, then it is on idea, it's, it's on ideological grounds. Does, does that make sense? They might as well be following a religion. And in fact, many academics, atheist academics, will tell you this, that atheists who believe in evolution and so on, for them, evolution is a religion. So that makes sense. It's like a fundamental tenet of their religion. You know, like one of the arkan. You know, we have our arkan al iman, right? One of their arkan al iman is evolution. And I'm not even, I haven't even started criticizing evolution. I don't even intend to. That's not the point. The point is, a lot of the conversations about what evolution is, what isn't, what are its evidences are irrelevant when you approach this from a logical, epistemological perspective based on what are the reasons why people believe in things. Do you understand? And then you realize actually, if I'm a blind believer in God, so are you a blind believer in evolution. So we're on an equal footing. Ha! Huh. If you are truly somebody who believes in evolution based on knowledge, based on science, and I am truly a person who believes in, in, in religion based on evidence and therefore also based on science. Remember our definition of science? And also based on science, then we can talk. Otherwise, lakum dinukum waliyadi. Does this logic make sense? Right. By the way, we all need to teach our children logic. It's really, really important. I don't mean logic in any kind of controversial kalami sense or anything like that. Just logic. Just how to think. Right, that's really, really important. Okay. So, so, the, so ideology, so evolution and ideology, science as ideology, right? So science as ideology is called, there's a name for it. What's it called? It's called scientism. It's called sign, scientism. Science is a method of inquiry, a method for studying the natural world. That's science, right? It's neutral, it's value neutral, it's open to everybody. We can study it as Muslims. We, we can value it as Muslims, nothing wrong with it, right? Science is not scientism. Science is an ideology. Although the, ideo the, the ideologues or the scientism people sometimes make it out as though science is only for them. It's only theirs, it's their jaida, basically, it's their personal, you know, it's their inheritance or something like that. But it's not. Science is neutral. It's for everybody. It's a, it's a, it's, it's just, it's just knowledge. Okay. We've got no problem with that. Is that, is that understood? Yeah. There's no clash between religion and science. Okay. Now, let's talk about audience. 
This is very important because without this, I don't want you guys thinking about evolution. I don't want you guys studying. I don't want you reading about it without first thinking about this. Does that make sense? So, when we think about science, or particularly when we think about the theory of evolution, it's important to think about who am I? Who am I and what is my relationship with evolution? Right? So I've come up with four categories. You can maybe have as many categories as you like. The first is ordinary Muslims who, who are like not particularly bothered. It makes no difference to them. Okay? Now, in truth, objectively speaking, in truth, whether you believe in evolution or you don't believe in evolution, does it make any difference to you? No, not really. Does it make any difference to you? Anyone? Does it make any difference to you in your life? Do you end up with less food on your plate, more food on your plate, earn more money, earn less money? For most people, it makes no difference to them. It makes zero difference to them. And even the science makes zero difference to you. Meaning, anything factual about the theory of evolution that contributes to something to science, right? There's probably no reason to reject, reject it, religiously speaking. I can guarantee you, there'll be no reason to reject it from a religious perspective. There'll be no problem, there'll be no contradiction whatsoever. Anything that is factual, that actually informs current science, right? Anything that is theoret theoretical, there's probably multiple explanations for it. When I say theoretical, I don't mean theoretical as in a theory, because everybody's like, oh, these religious people, these religious nut jobs, they always just say evolution is just a theory, and they don't know the difference between a scientific theory and just a theory. No, I, I get that. I understand. I'm not a scientist, but I've kind of read enough to know that there's a difference between just a theory and a scientific theory. So even if we say that some a scientific fact that's based on evolutionary theory, right? What you will find is the fact may remain still the same, but there can be a different explanation for it. Does, does that make sense? Right? And I, there's a, the, the most important one I'll talk about in a minute. Okay. So, for most Muslims, if you're not bothered about evolution, if you never knew anything about evolution, right? It wouldn't affect you. You're bothered about it because of your children. Does that make sense? Right. Second category, Muslims who've studied science and evolution at a basic level and are further curious. That's our kids. That's people who've been educated in this country. People who've done uh, chemistry, physics, biology, GCSE, maybe done, a, maybe done an A-level and so on and so forth. Who've studied science and evolution at a, ba at a basic level. That's the qualification. At a basic level and therefore remain curious about it. So when the question comes up, religion, atheism, religion, evolution, religion, science, they're like, oh, I started to be a science. Okay, what's that about? Right? So they have a certain, they have a kind of curious curiosity about it. Right? Naturally, they would have because it's something they have some familiarity with. Okay. Number three, Muslims who are professionals in the scientific world: doctors, pharmacists, people who are scientists in a lab, etc., etc. Now. Just because you're a doctor or, 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 or a pharmacist or even a scientist, it does not necessarily mean that your day-to-day -day engagements as a doctor have anything to do with evolution. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Meaning that there may be lots of things that in your practice as a doctor, a treatment that you give, etc., etc., that is based upon a certain assumption within evolutionary theory, but it doesn't affect you right now because most likely what you're prescribing right now is based on something far more r recent, a piece of policy, NHS policy. <laughs> Does that make, do you understand what I'm saying? It's th the way in which medicine is practiced for people is it doesn't have a great deal of research involved. Doctors have to learn. They do some of the theoretical work in their undergrad and, their, and early in their postgrad and so on. And then a lot of it is to do with the practice of medicine. Did you say you're a doctor? Does this make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? Right, good. So now, chances are that if you're an academic in the scientific area and you're researching questions that directly interact with evolution, then it's different. Then evolution has an impact on you intellectually on a regular basis. Yes? Right. Finally, 
there are Muslims for whatever reason for whatever reason right it could be because you know they study it could be because out of their own personal curiosity etc etc it could be because they watch too many YouTube videos they are Muslims who are convinced by evolution and they believe in it they are convinced by evolution and they believe in it four categories of people anybody want to contribute another one any others four categories of people okay this talk and some of the things I'm going to say in this talk really is about is may is, is is going to try and provide a solution for the final for the last category people who believe in evolution right i'm really some of the things i'm going to discuss is for them everything else i'm saying everything i've, I've said so far is for all of the other categories it's for everybody else and you know what you can walk in here thinking i wonder what sheikh is going to say and then walk out and never think about it again it won't make any difference to you it won't make any difference to your iman it won't make any difference to your life it won't put more petrol in your car you won't put more, put more, put more food on the table. You won't make any difference to you. It doesn't matter. For the most part, evolution doesn't matter. So, if you look at it from that perspective, right? Islam versus versus evolution, it becomes a non-issue, doesn't it? It's a non-issue. If you never thought about it, Allah never commanded you to think about it. You're okay. And the akhirah, did you find out about evolution? Is not going to be asked. Oh. Is this is this uh, is this understood? Young people, you studied evolution in school, but you're going to go become an engineer, all right? In the future, you're going to go become a lawyer or something like that. You, you probably never revisit it again. It doesn't matter. The thing that bothers people is how is is substantial, but epistemologically, okay. I keep using these words. Okay, so. The thing that bothers people is much more simple notions like if it's not true, why do so many scientists believe in it? That bothers people. That bothers young people. Right? That bothers our kids. That why do so many scientists believe in it? Why is it that my science teacher believes in it? Right? I had one kid who was, who was convinced by evolution. He was doing his A-levels. He'd already left Islam. He was doing Umrah with me. Already left Islam. Right? And he was like, you know, for hardcore science, evolution, etc., etc., and it was all down to his science teacher who was mentoring him. Ultimately, he was following that guy. That's it. So he was following that guy. He's blindly following his science teacher, and then he gets some of it. He actually gets some of it. You read. I tried to last few days in preparation for this course. I tried to read up on evolution, what it actually is. I was reading that and and I can even book on it, and I was like, really, is, is, is that what all the fuss is about? I can't. I'm a fairly intelligent guy and I was thinking there's no way some kid's gonna read this and like yeah I've got it I know exactly how life works it's not gonna happen all right it takes it, it it's because there's so many holes in the narrative all right maybe I'll talk about that a bit so the, the really the concern is with young people adults people from the science community who are who believe in evolution now we have to talk about okay well what is islam's relationship with evolution if somebody believes in it if you don't believe in it there's nothing that can make you believe in it there's no religious obligation for you to believe in it there is no scientific obligation for you to believe in it in fact if you were in a, if you were doing research into evolution and you didn't believe in it you wouldn't lose your job would you lose your job you wouldn't lose your job. So therefore, it's really a question of your own personal conviction. What if you are personally convinced of what? That evolution is true. That evolution is true. Now, on that word true, I'm going to move to my next slide, right? True. So we're going to talk about epistemology. Epistemology is the theory of knowledge. It's really important. I don't know why Muslims don't study this from our own perspective, not from some philosophical perspective, some pie in the sky stuff. I'm talking about from a Muslim perspective. Right? What is knowledge? What is truth? How do we know truth? How do we know what we know is true? How do we know Islam is true? These are all questions of epistemology. Does that make sense? What is knowledge? How is knowledge verified? How are things known? This, this is the question of epistemology. Now, here it's important to ask questions like, what is truth based on? 
What's truth based on? If you believe something is true, if you believe something is true, so mention something that's true. Shout out something that's true. <coughs> In your mind, something that's true. It's got to be something to do with life, so it can't be disputed. Like nobody can argue with you about it. Something that's true. Sunrises in the east. Sunrises in the east. Yes. How do you know that's true? You see it every day. You see it every. Okay, I might turn around and say, but what is east? <laughs> 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 now, now I'm getting philosophical, but alright, all right, I won't do that. Okay, so you understand? So okay, you know, it's like you observe it. You know, it's like it's like I live in South End. Well, how do you know that's true? I'm like, duh. <laughs> like, of course I live in. I, I, you know, this is South End. How do we know? Because, well, you know, this is how how addresses are organised, and my address is in South End, and I kind of know this area in England is called South End, right? You know, that's how you know. That's kind of how you know what what truth is, right? How do you know? So, what, what is truth based on? So sometimes it's based on observation, sometimes it's based on experience. Meaning it's kind of got to be based on some sort of proof that can be substantiated. Correct? Okay. With that in mind, we've got to ask ourselves questions like, is science truth? Is it truth? Yes. Always? Is it always truth? Yeah, if it's true, it's true. Right. If it's true, then it's true. Very, very good. Circular. Right. So, so, uh, and I suppose a, a more important question, is, a more relevant question is, how much of it is truth? Right? So therefore, every piece of science, the question remains, is it true or not? Because it could still be nothing to do with truth. For example, do scientists talk about the multiverse? Physicists. When I say scientists, we're talking about physicists now. Do they talk about the multiverse? Yes. Is it true? No way. No way true. You're saying no way true. But do they talk about it as a possible truth? I say there's no way to verify it. There's no way to verify it. So could you be talking about it as truth if you can't verify it? No. For it to be truth, it has to be verifiable. If it's not very, if, it, if you can't verify something, then it's not true. The other thing is they don't believe in it themselves. It's a, it's a piece of speculation. It's something that they're speculating about. It could be. Do you understand? Right? It's more like science fiction. But they are talking about it. So it is something that's discussed in science, right? So therefore, is all science truth? All science is not true, right? Some of it is just airy fairy theorizing and speculation. So sometimes it's important to recognize that. So that we know there are that there's still there are still there's still the ne the need to verify. Right? You still have to verify and prove. Okay? Right. Same question applies to evolution. Is evolution truth? Now we come down to the real question. Is evolution truth? It's a theory, right? Yes. It's a theory. It's a scientific theory. Is it true? No. No, it was not true. Hmm? Then why do so many people say it's true and it you know rivals religion and blah 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 and it's an explanation? It explains reality. Why do they say that? Shaitan's making them say it. Why did they say it? Okay, the answer is in something that I've said before. It's their ideology. Because it's their ideology. They're saying it's true because it's their it's their ideology. Whether it is true or not is besides the point. Do you understand what I'm trying to do? What I'm trying to do here? Whether it is in fact true or not is a question of science, right? It's a question of science. But why that person thinks it's true and it answers all reality, etc., etc., has got nothing to do with the evidence. It's got nothing to do whether it is indeed, indeed true or not. It's just his ideology. That's it, right? He is as blind, deaf, and dumb as the next man. It's just his ideology. He's just parroting stuff that he's read. You know, like they say, oh, you know, but they they've done it in, in they've seen it in labs and they've done this and they've done that and the the the, the you know the, the the genome proves it. Did you see it? You haven't seen it. You just read somebody's book. 
The point is, you're not a scientist. You can't verify that information. You're just following what somebody else says. Right? Oh, but then that. So, so yeah, but that's what you do as as a religious person. Well, it's fair enough. But as long as you admit that, then we can just part on equal terms. Do you understand? Ideology is ideology. Sometimes religious people are also ideologues. We, we have to accept that, right? You don't want to be an ideologue. You want to you want to believe in Islam based on hujja, based on proof. Go seek knowledge. Go and seek knowledge, and you you will you'll you'll arrive at Islam based on knowledge, okay, and based on proof, right? So we can then go on and say, is is science, is evolution, is it probable knowledge? Probable knowledge is something that is proven to the point that you feel like it is most probably true that's probable knowledge meaning most likely it's most likely to be true meaning more than 50 percent is true does that make sense so that's i'm asking the question is it probable knowledge or is it simply the the most probable current scientific theory <laughs> And if you look at how evolution is understood in the academic world, not in popular consumption, not Richard Dawkins evolution, not YouTube videos, right? Not atheist uh, kind of narratives, yeah? It's not, not apologetics, not debates. If you look at actually what academics in universities say about, about evolution, they'll say something similar to that last bit. That to the best of our current knowledge, right, it is the most probable current scientific theory. Current scientific theory. So what does that current bit mean? It means it can change. It means it can change. And already there are bits of evolution that mainstream atheist evolutionary biologists at universities based on their research are already challenging about evolution, about, Darwin, about, about Darwin's theory. You understand? It doesn't take long to find this stuff out if you if you just put in the right search. Do you, do you understand? It is simply the mo the most probable. So as far as we know, based on the information we have now, we believe evolution or evolution is a probable theory. Why call it a theory at all? Because it is not a truth. It is an attempt at arriving at an explanation for a set of data for a set of data we've got all of this data the data doesn't speak so i'll give you an example right so you all know most people know now is i don't have to break it down uh, to this level right that the evidence for evolution is in evolution the evidence for it is in what fossils, fossils. the fossil record right so this stuff that's been dug up they found way, ways to date it right and it shows that the deeper you go the simpler the life forms etc etc the more fossils they dig up in darwin's time there were hardly any fossils his theory has been validated by the fact that the more fossils that they dig up the more his theory sounds sounds, sounds likely the more th his theory makes sense this was further supported by uh the word is not coming to me now. genetics thank you this was further supported by by genetics right and you know and that provided and the other is homology right the um if you like the the things that are common between species they've observed that there are things that are common in all species that that, that shows a certain relationship right and then the genetics of it and the fossil record shows that that relationship is hereditary or based on heredity right so uh, you know like species basically have adopted features from each other over mill over time over millions of years so not only do i pass on features to my children but species part on pass on features to other species over millions and billions of years okay how, how do we arrive at these conclusions well we look at this 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 data the, the 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 genetic data we look at the fossil record and we ask ourselves hang on how did we go from here to here and here to here that's the data that's the that's the proof that's the evidence right is the evidence speaking is the fossil going i oh, mr dawkins well actually you know i'm this particular species and then i passed on this particular feature to that particular species the one that's sitting over on that desk over there 
Did, this, did the fossil report speak? It didn't. So what had to happen? What happened? It had to be interpreted. It had to be interpreted, right? So the most current probable theory is when the in, they come up with an interpretation that seems to be scientifically the most likely explanation for all of this data. Do you understand how it works? Now tell me, can something like that be truth? Can something like that be truth? It could be. It could be. But you could never know, could you? Any claim to truth would simply be a claim. You could never know if it was in fact truth. Because it involves so much interpretation done by you today. You're interpreting and deciding what happened a billion years ago. How can you be claiming truth? You would be arrogant to claim truth. Do you understand how it works? It's really important because sometimes people are like, oh, evolution is fact. Excuse me. Let's get our terminology. You know, what does fact mean? You can't possibly know something as fact if it happened a billion years ago. You can theorize about it. You can speculate. You can speculate about it. You can come up with an interpretation for what you think you've dug up that was from a million years ago. Do, do, do you understand? Right. So, so that's one thing. Now you can ask the same question about Islam. And this is where I start talking about Islam. It, I, like I said, I, I don't want to tell you what evolution is because you can probably just watch a YouTube video or read a book. Right? Yeah? If you know it, you know it. If you don't know it, you don't need to know it. This is the whole point of me saying it doesn't make any difference to your life. Those of you who know evolution, know evolution and are bothered by it, yes, then you know what I'm talking about. Right. Now the next important question to be fair is, are Islam's fundamental claims truth? When you believe in a fundamental claim about Islam, Allah is one. Is that, is that fundamental truth of Islam? Allah is true. Allah is one. Muhammad is Allah's messenger. Yes? He, uh, he is Allah's final messenger. Allah sent angels. There are such things as angels. These are some of our fundamental truths. The Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through Jibreel. These are some of our fundamental truths. All right? These are our truth claims. Do we believe in them as truth? Yes? Yes. This is the difference, right? We believe in it as truth. Now, an atheist would be like, yeah, but you believe in it blindly. But do, but do we though? Do we? This is the question. This is the question. Do we believe in it blindly or do we not? Now, if you believe based on what your parents told you, you do believe in it blindly because you don't know the evidence. But that doesn't mean the evidence doesn't exist. And therefore, it's necessary now for who? For our children. Right, who are going to be influenced by evolution, and for you, the person who is convinced by evolution, to then investigate what are the truth claims of Islam based on, so that you can then ask yourself the proof for the truth claims of Islam when I put them against the truth claims of science or evolution in particular. Science, no, because science, there's no fundamental clash between Islam and science, right? Evolution, right. Where is the, you know, which one comes out stronger as a claimant for truth? Evidentially, which one is stronger? Which one is based on a stronger proof? Which one is based on a more living, a more living history? Because remember I said to you, the fossil record doesn't speak. Does our historical re record speak? It absolutely does. Because it is recorded history. It is recorded history. This happened at such and such a time. Who said it happened? No, not me. I'm not saying, I'm not interpreting something that was dug up from the ground. I'm not saying this happened. Who's saying it happened? The people from the past are saying it. So the history is speaking. So when we when we hear that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did this, received revelation from Jibreel, said this, right acted in this way we are not interpreting a, de a, a dumb piece of data we're not interpreting something that doesn't speak we're not interpreting a fossil record we are reading 
a, a, a narration in the words of the person who witnessed that incident. Do you understand the difference? It's a night and day difference between the two, between the nature of the two proofs. One is a one is a dead fossil, right? That has to be interpreted, and therefore uh, the story that you give it does not belong to the fossil. It belongs to who? You. It belongs to you. You're providing the story. So these are important questions of epistemology, right? Whereas in our history, the, the story is being provided by the piece of history itself, by the narration itself, which comes from the person in history, right? Then comes the question of, well, how do you know that's true? How do you know? That's true. And then there's a whole scientific conversation about how we know that's true, right? The science of hadith, the science of isnad, all of that corroborated over and over again by trustworthy narrators. There's a whole scientific system that basically makes us believe that a piece of evidence is either certain, you must believe in it, or it is probable. We have probable evidence too. We also have probable evidence. If a, if, a, if, a, if a narration cannot be proven to be of the highest level of certainty, then we believe in it as probable evidence. We, we look at it as a piece of probable historical data, not as a piece of certain historical data. Do you understand? And our fundamental beliefs, Allah, the Prophet, angels, some of our fundamentals, the Quran, are, are not based on the probable information, but based on the, the certain information. Does that make sense? This is how, what is the difference between, a, in the Hanafi Madhab, right? What is the difference between a Fard and a Wajib? A lot of people don't know this, right? But what is the difference between a Fard and a Wajib? Practically no difference, right? You have to do both of them. Yes? So then why, why two different terms? Why two different terms? Very simple. It's to do with the fact that the fard is based on a certain piece of information. It is based on a certain piece of information, like a verse of the Quran. The wajib is based on a probable piece of information. So because of the strength of proof, the fuqaha felt the need to differentiate. Do you understand? And how do we differentiate? One, you must believe in and practice. The other, you must believe in and practice. But if you didn't, you will still retain your Islam. Whereas if you disbelieved in a fard, you wouldn't retain your Islam. You would have apostated. Why? Because you're disbelieving in something that is certain. Whereas over here, you're disbelieving in something that is probable. So we have these, these layers, these different levels of, of evidence and so on. Now, obviously, I can't tell you all of it now. But if you were to study it, I guarantee you, it would be far more convincing. What I guarantee you, it would be far more convincing than evolution. <laughs> so when you stand with the two things in front of you, you're going to be like, okay, I'm supposed to disbelieve in that, which sounds, which come, which is stronger for this, which is weaker. If you did do that, okay, let's just say, brother, what's your name? Muhammad um, Brother Muhammad. Let's just say, brother Muhammad, he studied Islam's proofs, and he studied the proofs of evolution, right? And he came to the conclusion that Islam's proofs are more convincing to him. They seem to be more certain. They provide him with greater certainty than the proofs of evolution. Now, if he still doubted Islam's truths based on apparent contradictions in evolution, would that be logical? Would it be logical? No. It wouldn't be logical because you're believing in something that you yourself consider to be more certain. Right? If you're believing in something that you yourself consider to be less certain, over something that is? Because that's logical. That's, it's, it's, it's not logical. It's illogical to do that, right? Now, what am I saying to you is that this is that. Cause I, the reason why I do, I, do the, I do it like this is because I don't want you to just follow things because I said so. Because then you're just blind following, right? If you are the guy that is convinced by evolution, right? If you're the person that is convinced by evolution and you believe in it, don't you owe it to yourself to make and, and you and and how hang on you believe in it and you think it clashes with some aspect of religion right then don't you owe it to yourself to find out what the truth claims of islam are based on and what those evidences are based on right 
If you don't, then you're then regardless of how strong the proof for evolution is, your behavior is irrational. Right? And you are acting like an ideologue rather than a seeker of truth. Does this make sense? And this is how I want to come at this. The rest of you, you don't believe in evolution, no problem. Don't think about this ever again. <laughs> right? It's not going to affect you in your life. But if you do believe in it, then obviously there is a conversation to be had. But the first thing you've got to do is you've got to think epistemologically and you've got to ask yourself, okay, I need to investigate Islam's claims of truth. I know all this stuff about science, but what do I know about Islam? Nothing. Well, then I'm sorry. There's, whether or not there is a contradiction is irrelevant. Right? The contradiction in your own head, right, is based on nothing because you don't know anything about Islam. You don't know anything about Islam's claims of truth. So the problem is a subjective one, meaning within the person who feels conflicted about religion because of his belief in evolution, there is a problem if that person doesn't know what Islam's truth claims are based on. Does that make sense? Within that person, there is a problem. There is an irrationality. Right, now let's move on to the actual issue. Right Now, and this is going to be really quick. <laughs> now, so let's just say that uh, I know what the truth claims of Islam are based, what the truth claims of Islam are based on. <laughs> so first of all, actually, this is hypothetical because I'm one of those guys that's curious about evolution. It makes no difference to me. It makes no difference to me whether it's tr whether I believe in it, don't believe in it. If somebody says, "Do you believe in evolution?" I'll be like. It's interesting. <laughs> Meaning that I have no, there's not, there's, I, there's no imperative within me that makes me feel the need to believe in evolution. <clears throat> Does that make sense? It doesn't impact my line of work. It so for me, it's just curiosity. The stuff I know about evolution is more to do with curiosity than it is to do with truth. I'm not interested in evolution as a truth because I don't believe there is a fundamental clash. However, as somebody who believes in the truth of Islam, and given that there is a claim that it clashes with Islam, it's necessary for me to investigate what that clash might be. Does that make sense? Okay, so evolution as a theory and Islam, right? Principally, the, 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 the actual clash between the two, in, if, 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 a per, if a person, remember it's to do with a person, it's to do with you if you believe in it. The actual clash is really only in the question of Adamic creation. In the question of the creation of Adam and Islam, right? Because the first and foremost, right, if somebody, like Islam doesn't tell us if we were created by evolution or something else. Islam just says Allah created us, right? Theoretically, hypothetically, theoretically, without the data, without the proof, or, or, or with the, if, if hypothetically tomorrow, we all agreed with the scientists. All the Muslim scholars in the world decided, you know what? The science is compelling. And let me tell you the only way in which they could legitimately do that, based on our methodology, our epistemology, they could only legitimately do that if the Muslims did the science themselves. If we did the science ourselves, in our own labs, right, did our own research, checked all of the data ourselves, right, then decided, yes, absolutely, it's compelling. Do you understand? You know, evolution is true. If that did happen, hasn't happened, won't happen, but let's just say it happened. If that did happen, right, then Muslims would simply believe, oh, so Allah created, Allah created biological creation based on evolution. That's it. Does, does that make sense? That's it. So Allah created us, we never knew exactly, precisely how He created us because Allah can say kun, fayakun, etc, etc. So He resorted to, uh, he, he, in His Sunnah, He used the system of evolution. Oh, but what about time? What about time? What about all of this time? Well, uh, hello, Allah is above time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala transcends above time. Time is nothing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What, what is a billion years to creation? is nothing to Allah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above it. Allah manipulates time. Allah 
manipulates time. That's why when we go on safar, we pray to Allah, Allah shorten the distance for me. When it, do you understand? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manipulates time and space because time is his creation. You understand? So the question of time is irrelevant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm being completely hypothetical here. If Muslims have been studying, Muslim scholars have been studying the evidence decided evolution is true. That's all it would be. But then here comes the clash. The clash then would be, but what about that? What about the fact that Allah says He created Adam al Islam by His own hand? Because Allah does say that in the Quran. He says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam al Islam by His own hand. How would you reconcile Allah creating Adam by His own hand if He created everything based on evolution? Right? So we would say, well, Adam is the exception. Adam is the exception. What's the problem? Adam al Islam is the exception. Banu Adam. Banu Adam is the exception. There was all of this evolution going on in the world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam, created Hawa, put them in Jannah, and then put them on the earth. Can science disprove that? Science can't disprove that. Science cannot disprove that. So we would have reconciled evolution with with Adamic, Adamic creation. Now, obviously the, the, the big white elephant in the room is, do we need to do that? Do we need to do that? We don't need to do that. We don't need to do that because we are not dealing with a rival truth. We are not dealing with a rival truth. However, if you, Mr. Zaid Amar Bakr, you, right, as a science person, if you feel like it is a rival truth, in your mind, evolution is true, and you are conflicted because you want to believe Islam is also true, and you want to know if there is a way to reconcile the two, well, that's a possible method. So the question of reconciling isn't relevant to everybody. Do you understand? Because evolution isn't relevant to all of us. It doesn't bother all of us. It bothers some people, right? For those people, they have to, before they even think about reconciling, before they even think about reconciling, they first have to find out what Islam is based on, what Islam's fundamental truths are based on. And it may well be that their reconciling is simply going to be based on, you know what, this is the truth, this is just some theory. So I'm just going to carry on engaging with it as something that is really interesting. Do you understand? If, it's, if, if it turns out to be truth, it, what, the day I think it's truth, that's the day I'll think about how it can be reconciled. For now, it's not truth, so I don't need to worry about it. You understand? That is a far more logical way to deal with this than all this fuss. It's like, you know what, it's exactly like getting caught up in advertisement. You know, something's being advertised and you're like, yeah, I'm going to go buy it. I'm going to go buy it. Do you understand? You're being hoodwinked. You don't need to think everything matters to you when it doesn't. It doesn't matter to you, right? It might matter to you individually because within yourself there is a contradiction. Then you deal with it. If within yourself there is a contradiction, then you deal with it. The way you do that is first you find out about your deen. First you learn about your deen. Then secondly you think about reconciling it with this other thing that you think might be truth. Now, the reason why I explained it like this is because that principle applies to if somebody believes homosexuality is natural. Right? The, it, the same principle applies to every other thing, right, that we encounter in our lives that we think clashes with Islam. Right? The same principle applies to alternative moral uh, moral uh, principles. There's something about uh, about secular ethics that you're convinced by, and you're like, "Hang on a second, but this doesn't. This clashes with Islam. How do you deal with it?" Well, actually, before you make any draw any conclusions, go find out what Islam is based on. Then see if there is a clash. The way to reconcile a lot of problems is first by learning about Islam. Do you understand? Then revisiting, revisiting the apparent contradiction. Does, does this make sense? Or is that a useful way to look at things? Right? Because otherwise, today's evolution, tomorrow it's going to be something else. The next day it's going to be a, a fourth issue. Then it's going to be another issue. It's going to be another issue. What's confusing us? Not the issue itself. What's confusing us? 
our lack of knowledge of our deen. That's what's confusing us. Okay, inshallah. Zakumla khairan. I have no idea how long I spoke for, probably for too long. And you know, I hope this was beneficial. I have no idea if I approached this the right way. This is what came to me. This is what came to me. Okay? So uh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, protect our iman, protect our children, uh, and may He bless us with, with beneficial knowledge. I mean. Just a while ago, we were not enough time. I want to just say that is what my perception is. Science is the knowledge of creation of Allah. Science is the knowledge of creation of Allah. And when we separate it from Islam or Deen, we are wrong. Deen, what we is referred to is knowledge of Deen. That is a, a part of Islam as well. But I'll just give you an example. For example, if there's a car and car needs petrol, its tire needs uh, inflation, needs uh, air in that, and there are so, so many complex machinery. But Deen is the like driver. So the driver can take the car for uh, robbing or for good deeds. Similarly, everything, the whole science is really knowledge of uh, creation of Allah. And things can be distorted, even religion is distorted. There are so many pitfalls in our religion. So they are against each other. Some call the others kafir and some call them. So uh, this is something which we need really. So I can discuss it another time. But this is something which is, we must not say Islam, uh, science is separate or this or that. I mean, the people who go for Hajj, there are some people doing uh, this, um, uh, going out with ambulance, certain ambulance. Uh, so some of them are pickpockets. They are just stealing. So that doesn't mean they are doing a bother or they are doing a hajj, or um, whatever. So, inshallah, I don't want to take more time. Just for that no, there's, there's no contradiction, basically. There's no contradiction between Islam and science. Okay, inshallah. I'm going to encourage the sisters to get their food. Um, and we'll take, if the sisters have questions, I'll be around there. You can ask me or you can shout out from the back. Uh, is there any questions from the, from the brothers? Any questions? No. You want food? It's last. Uh, so a question, I mean it was a beautiful talk, Mashallah. Uh, so any questions which people have about the talk or generally, uh, even if it's like on a more practical level, how can we, like one of my things is maybe, or what I would be interested in is, if our solution is to understand our religion better, then which sciences okay. would change our perception? Because honestly we're not taught Islam to come to that. on a deep level. So I was in this machine we picked up with Tajweed and Arabic, <coughs> And we're thinking about what maybe science we could delve into as well. So this is something of a personal mission of mine, right? I believe that across the board, Muslims, particularly uh, uh, our ulama, our imams, our teachers, it goes without saying. I think we, we know some of it, we've learned it in our Islamic sciences, but we have to mould it into a logical narrative that makes sense to today's sort of uh, minds. So our ulama, our imams, parents, um, and, and, our, and our particularly teens, right, from 13, 14 upwards, as their intellect matures, we need to study the proofs of Islam. Okay? Now, proofs of Islam, there's lots of ways to approach it, right? The way I approach it, um, the way I approach it is very similar to how I addressed today's talk. Right. So would you recommend like something like that? 
Yeah, like, like what we do in what we do uh, in, in Chelmsford, what Brother Sevier does in Chelmsford. So th those th that made that kind of topic. So, for example, um, what are the thi what are, what areas of discussion talk about Islam's fu fu fundamental truths? And it's not aqidah as you know. You know, usually people are like, oh, we have to study our aqidah, right, or our beliefs. But often when we study our beliefs, we don't study them from a truth perspective, but we study them as content of Aqidah, meaning we believe in X, Y, and Z. And then very swift, quickly we move on to sectarian Aqidah. We believe in X, Y, and Z, and so on, so it's deviant because they believe in something different. Does that make sense? That's kind of how Aqidah moves. The question of proof is a different kind of question. Now people will be like, yeah, it's true because it's in the Quran. Do you understand? But any person, particularly in today's day and age, would be would ask the question, well, why is the Quran true? Do you understand? Oh, well, the Quran is true because Allah, because Allah revealed it. So how do you know that's true? Do you understand? And it's these questions that have to be answered. And the, the answers, honestly, when it, when it comes to this stuff, Muslims stand on the shoulders of giants. Our ulama have done a stellar job when it comes to answering these types of questions. It's just that a lot of it just hasn't been articulated very well to to our community. It's not travelled down to the community level because we have we've kept knowledge of Islam given to children in particular at such a basic level, right, that we never even go anywhere near that stuff. So for me, actually studying these things actually improves critical thinking. It improves their critical thinking and it will actually make them better at school. It will make them better thinkers, right? So therefore, the way I would approach it is, uh, number one is some logic from an Islamic perspective. And what I mean by that is, the, I, I like to frame things in questions. The answer to the question, how does the, how does the, how does the Islamic tradition prove things? How does our intellectual tradition prove things? How do we prove claims of truth? When somebody says something to you, yeah, how do you verify it as truth? Does, does that make sense? So, we, so you might be like, oh, okay, what's that about? You know, it's getting too complicated. No, we actually have a methodology. Our methodology, it's important to know that methodology because if you study that methodology correctly, then it will also go into science and what Islam's relationship with science is because scientific claims are also claims. So therefore the question of how do we know it's true still applies to that as well. Right? And from there we will be able to arrive at the conclusion that actually, fundamentally and epistemologically, there is no clash because the way we would verify that would be using empirical methods. Does that make sense? And where there are clashes, the clashes are apparent clashes because people have, basically people are being illogical. Anyway, so firstly, so I call that epistemology, that's the epistemological bit, right? How do we know? Or how do we know things? How do we verify claim, claims to truth? The second thing then is the most important that, you know, I, I would start from here, which, and that is proofs of prophethood. Why is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a true prophet of Allah? Again, very well covered. You know, ulama have, there's some ulama and some, some counts of proofs of prophethood exceed a thousand. I think Imam al-Bayhaqi said something like 1300. Something crazy like that, right? But obviously, proofs of prophethood have to be based on, have to be authentic. They have to be, that's something that needs to be always verified and checked. Um, Sirat al-Nabi, if those of you who read Urdu, Sirat al-Nabi, volume 2 onwards, has an excellent discussion on proofs of prophethood, right, that very few people know about, because everybody reads volume 1, which is to do with the story of the Sirah and stops. I was like, we read the story of the Sirah, mashallah, alhamdulillah, they put it down, and then the volume 2 deals with questions of of proof and truth, right? So anyway, so the Nabi has an excellent section, um, you know, uh, and so forth, right? So uh, the point is that I would, in your masjid, uh, in the curriculum for the children and so on, I would include things like that. The next thing, after proofs of prophethood, would be proofs of Allah. And you might, I, you, many people teach proofs of Allah first. I like to teach proofs of Allah after, because that is how we arrived at it. <coughs> Does that make sense? Because proofs of prophethood gives us our authority. 
And most Muslims, particularly Muslims who are born into Islam, we arrive at our truth through authority because our parents teach us, our teachers teach us, and we come to believe in it. So it's important to recognize how authority works. <coughs> Essentially, the authority that your parents have, based on which you believe their religion is true, isn't really their authority. It comes from the Prophet. It comes from believing that the Prophet is a true Prophet of Allah. It's called Sidq al Muhbir, the idea that the one who told us about Allah and about Islam and about the Quran is truthful. Ali Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And from there we go to belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, we would have an authority based proof in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is through the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, and then and the Quran, of course. And then from there we move on to rational proofs for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is common in all religions. Right? From there we can then talk about um, things like uh, what are the issues in today's times that cause doubts in the minds of Muslims and what are their answers? These are some of the key things that need to be included in our conversations, in our dialogues, in our talks, particularly in our curriculums, right? And what we teach in madrasas and so on. And adults and young people alike need to study these things if we want to deal with the, the kind of woke onslaught, this, this crazy kind of normalization of LGBT and it being forced down our children's throats so that our children are forced to agree and accept and validate and so on and so forth, things that are basically kufr, right? How do we protect our children from that if their natural inclination often is to, is to feel connected to the left? to the political left because we are a minority so when they feel connected to the political left they feel they also need to come up with a way of thinking that can also defend the rights of other minorities such as the LGBT uh, people right and nobody's talking to them about how that kind of what their faith has to say about all of this what Islam has to say about all of this nobody's talking to them about that so they they oscillate between acceptance to homophobia. Do you understand? And neither of them is, a, is an acceptable position from an Islamic perspective. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? So it needs to be based on knowledge and knowledge only comes through teaching, through learning and teaching. Right? So knowledge comes from come from actually engaging in education. It doesn't come from YouTube video consumption. Right? And that means it has to come from teachers, you know, in masajid, in schools and so on, right? And parents have to engage in these conversations. Dialogue kind of matures thought, right? And that dialogue isn't happening. Nobody has time for dialogue because everybody's playing computer games and so on and so forth. And parents can't dialogue with their children about these things because they don't have the knowledge of themselves. Right? So parents need to need to also learn these things. For the younger kids in an age appropriate where we can introduce some of the basic concepts, for older kids it needs to be taught properly uh, and systematically. <laughs> And personally, this is what I do. This is, I, I run a mentoring program called the Youth Mentoring Program for 14 to 18 year olds, and I basically teach this stuff to them. All right, it's a couple of hours a week. It doesn't clash with their GCSEs. It doesn't clash with their busy schedules, and we cover this stuff. Uh, I have a couple of youth programs like that. And for adults, I run um, a course called How to Protect Our Iman in Today's Climate that covers these things. And basically, I run them online off of my website called Mobile Lifestyle. So even now that I'm an imam in Chelmsford, one of the things that I bring kind of to the masjid as an imam is, is these kind of things. So I'm trying to incorporate these things into the madrasa curriculum as well as try to impart them to the adults and so on. And, that's, and the thing is, I can't educate everyone. So I ask, I, everywhere I go, I say to imams, become familiar with this stuff teach to the community, including into the in, into your madrasa curriculum. Sheikh Noor is a big issue, is known like on social media, on WhatsApp and these things, people just without any verification. Yeah. Or authenticity, yeah. just share the things and yeah. without any verification. Yeah, so this is why I said if you teach young people okay. about epistemology and how we verify things, how we verify truth, then why would they ever believe in something that they picked up on social media? They have the tools, you've given them, you've given them the tools now. It's really, really important. And as a general piece of information, I, I can say to young people all day long, never consume anything from social media, but they will still consume it until I've given them a new way to think. Because at the moment they think in terms of quick pleasure, right? Social media isn't so much knowledge seeking, but more about 
the experience that they get out of that, right? And then that soon that crystallizes into, into knowledge and assumptions and so on. But ultimately, our job is to build intelligence, right? And intelligence doesn't build in people because you just teach them lots of facts. Intelligence builds when you give people methodology and ways of thinking. Okay, inshallah. So, Sheikh, I think for a lay person, the easiest way or the quickest is for pas alu and the thing. Yeah. The all of like methodology, as you mentioned. Yeah. When you're in the masjid, you have a great imam. Very much you have a great mom, come and ask. Come on, come on, come and ask. Right? But obviously some nowadays the thing is everything has a new interpretation, right? So you say first Elu Ahladik, ask people of knowledge. And then people are like, okay, fine, I'll go Google search it and see what scholar says well on the internet. Right? right? So people are like people are like, is that Google is the new Sheikh? You know? It's like go ask Sheikh Google. And then Sheikh Google refers you to Sheikh so and so and Sheikh so and so and Sheikh so and so. They all give four different answers and you're like, okay, now what? Now, now I'm confused. Sheikh Google has confused me. So therefore, go with people you can have a contact with, you can, who you can go back to, who you can talk to, and that's your, your local scholar, right? Your local imam and so on. Okay, inshallah. Sure. And should we wrap up? Yeah, let's wrap up. Okay. Subhanallah uh, khairan. Subhanallah wa hamdi subhanakallah 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 wa hamdi subhanak